Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we've just sung, open the eyes of our hearts. We know that that's words that we've just heard also read to us uh, in uh, Ephesians. May you um, uh, have the hearts of your, uh, the eyes of our hearts enlightened. Father, we pray that as we turn to your word now, that uh, you would just enable us to hear and Father, above all else, we pray that you would just open our hearts to your word, that it would shape and mold us uh, and increase in us love and fruitfulness and faithfulness. Uh, we ask these things for your name's sake. Amen. Uh, at our pastoral care course, uh, our first meeting, we had a, a brief conversation towards the end uh, about the difference between uh, praying for circumstances and praying for things of the heart. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, particularly when uh, one of our boys was ill, <clears throat> people asked us, what can we pray for? What can we pray for? Well, the obvious answer is, actually, can we pray that the doctors will work out what's wrong, that the hospitals will admit him, um, and various things, and actually that we can pray that he will get well again. That's praying for his circumstance. But it's good too, isn't it, to be praying as we did, that actually through moments of difficulty, uh, his faith would remain strong, that it seemed when things wasn't working out the way that uh, any of us imagined or hoped for, that actually we would pray that he wouldn't uh, lose his trust in God, that God had good things for him in store. Those are the prayers of the hearts, which means that actually whatever the circumstances, we're praying actually that they are strong. And therefore, as we look at uh, Ephesians this morning uh, and a section which I'm sure in your Bibles is, um, they've put in a, a helpful thing for us, uh, prayer and thanksgiving is what it says in mine. It's a real privilege, not just to, to hear teaching from Paul like we did last week, but also to look at how he prays uh, and what his approach to prayer is, but also to see how he prays for the heart, but also to note what he doesn't pray for, because actually, if we look at the prayers for the, uh, the sorry, if we look at prayers that are prayers for the heart, then we can all pray those. Whereas circumstance prayers are only in that moment for particular situations. What's great as we look in Ephesians is that there is nothing about their circumstances, about their persecution, uh, uh, about what it's like to live uh, uh, under Roman times, about maybe some of the suffering they're experiencing economically because of their stand for Jesus. As we look over Paul's shoulder and his prayers, what we see are prayers for the hearts. So although they were the prayers for the Ephesians, they're prayers that we can pick up uh, and we can model our, our prayer life on them too. He begins with thankfulness for their genuineness. I know that's an awful title, isn't it? I couldn't think of anything better, but anyway. But it's, in a sense, what he is doing is that he is coming before God uh, and saying, I I'm thankful. Let me read it to you. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not seek to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Or what we might say uh, in modern language, it is mentioning you. I usually, he's telling them that when I get down and pray, I pray for you by name. Uh, and notice the two things that give him cause for thanksgiving uh, as he prays for them. It's the, the faith in Jesus that they have and their love for each other. Uh, and that pairing is really, really important because I think what he's saying is, I see that your faith is authentic. Because actually, it's really easy, isn't it, to have a, a, a faith that's kind of just up in my head, you know. Yes, I believe these things. Yes, I know that Jesus existed. Yes, I know that he died on the cross. And all of that is kind of like head knowledge. 
Uh, and yes, what it does is it kind of uh, means that actually if I think those things uh, and if I believe in a God who is a creator God, a sustainer God, uh, and all these things, they can just be in my mind. And yes, I might be separate or distinct from the culture which I'm in, but they don't impact my life or who I am. I can have a belief that makes no difference whatsoever. But what Paul does here is he says there's authenticity because believing and knowing and trusting the right things about God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit actually lead to changed lives. Uh, and he says that, you know, it's great because I see your faith and I see how that's worked out in terms of the love that you have for each other. But actually, love only without faith, uh, a love here which unites them, is in a sense difficult, isn't it? Because lots and lots of people are loving. Uh, and the nature of love is that it's accepting and uh, we want to affirm and we welcome everything. But, of course, if love is tied together with belief, then actually it enables us to say, uh, we love you and we want the very best for you. But the best that we want for you is actually what God has for you, because that's actually how we love and care. It's important that we don't just think that love is divorced or separate from belief. It's the two together that actually make for genuineness, authenticity of a, a Christian discipleship. And therefore Paul is thankful for their genuineness. But also, uh, Paul's thankfulness is genuine. You could say, he's saying this, uh, has he got rose-tinted spectacles? Is he looking at them in such a way as to say, do you know what, uh, I think you're absolutely amazing uh, and uh, you are the best church ever and I think you're great. No, he's not at all like that. He is thankful for their faith. And yet, in chapter 2, he will remind them that actually they must hold on to uh, salvation by grace through faith alone. And he has to remind them this, that actually they've got to trust in that and that alone. So although he's thankful for their faith, he still needs to maybe correct them a little bit about where their faith is going astray. He's thankful for their love. But when we get to chapter 4, he's writing to them, you know, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Presumably, he wouldn't be having to tell them about this unless it was an issue. He's thankful for their love, even though they're struggling to remain united, struggling to be at peace with one another. You see, Paul's thankfulness comes from seeing them through the eyes of faith. Remember what he's told them so far. They are chosen and holy and blameless and forgiven and adopted and heirs and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is the truth. Remember he tells them, or he will tell them in, uh, in chapter 2, you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. He's already talked about actually every single blessing that they have. So when he prays for them, this is what he sees. He sees what God has done for them and sees their eternal uh, perspective, not just their current issues. He sees what he's looking for. How often uh, have you been in church prayer meetings where, um, I've written Stephen here, I hope there isn't a Stephen here. Um, if there is a Stephen watching, this is not about you, okay? This is just a random name I've picked. But I, I wonder if you've ever been in a kind of a church meeting uh, where they say, oh, let's pray for Stephen. Actually, do you know what? He serves coffee uh, most weeks, and it's great that he serves, but actually he does it with such a sour face. He had a real go at somebody who asked for soya milk in their coffee because they were vegan, and he just moans constantly if anybody asks if they've got decaffeinated or not. We really need to pray for him. 
Because the danger, isn't it, in church life is that as we look around, we see everything that's wrong with others. We see their failings. We see what they're not good at. We want to pray for them because all that we see in them is the, the way in which they're not the way God wants them to be. And it just doesn't work. And of course, you're sitting there and thinking, well, of course I know this. I know loads of you uh, will be implying this in your workplace, in your business. Actually, we grow people through commending goods. We use tools like Strength Finder and all these other things, which are all about actually finding what people are really, really good at uh, and focusing on what they're good at to grow them to be really confident, capable uh, and fantastic people. That's the world of work. Why isn't the church like that? Well, Paul says, this is what we need to do. And it starts with how we look at one another and what we see. Do we see somebody that actually struggles, that actually is irritating? Does somebody that really, really needs to address X, Y, and Z in their lives? Or actually, do we look at people with genuine thankfulness because of what God has done for them and who they will be in God and the glorious uh, uh, person that they will be for all eternity? It changes, doesn't it? The way we see people, the way we then pray for people. Isn't it great that Paul prays with thankfulness because of what he sees? And then Paul goes on to pray for, uh, I've written here, what God has said he will do and pray for what God has done through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Before we just get into that, let me uh, just do a little bit of detour about understanding uh, uh, salvation uh, by grace through faith. Uh, when I was a teenager, I had two ways of getting to school. Uh, the first was... Uh, uh, to ride a bike. Uh, it was about a 45 minute cycle ride to school, uh, particularly when it was uh, 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 sunny and it does occasionally be sunny in England, yeah, no. Uh, and there were a few hills, but actually um, I, I'd worked, I'd got a Saturday job, I'd paid, I had a, fan, I, I love, I had a lovely racing bike, still got it in the garage. Um, uh, and it was great, I loved doing it. But it was quite hard work, and particularly at the end of a long day, um, some of the hills uh, were quite challenging. Or because of the distance I lived from school, uh, I got a free bus pass from the uh, county council, and I could ride a bus. And of course, that's the easy, easy option. It doesn't cost me anything. I just get on a bus, and the bus stop was actually literally right outside the school. I could do that. Helpful for us to be thinking, how do we understand salvation? Well, actually, it's not like riding a bike. No matter how hard we try and how much effort we put in, we can never save ourselves. We will never get ourselves into that place where we've got a perfect relationship with Jesus, where we live a life of love that is completely, uh, as we have uh, read earlier in chapter 1, holy and blameless. We'll never, ever, ever get there. And it's great, isn't it, that salvation is a gift from God that there is nothing about us that uh, means that we deserve this. There is no merit or achievement that can earn, earn it. It's a gift. But it's not like a bus pass in that we say, actually, great, God has rescued me and I'm here and I'm sitting on the bus to eternity and actually I just don't need to do anything else. Now, the Bible teaches that we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, actually to work at our salvation. What it means is that actually uh, we have to be involved in the, in the, in the process. Uh, that's why Paul writes, uh, put on the fruits of the Spirit and all the rest. It's a gift. But actually, that doesn't mean to say that we can sit back and say anything, everything is done. We need perseverance, we need to grow, we need to strengthen our faith. And it's really vital that we understand that because that's how we begin to understand how Paul prays. Uh, look with me at verse 17. That 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul is praying for wisdom, for revelation, for knowledge. Just go back to last week, look at verse 8. What has God lavished upon us? Wisdom and insight, making known or revealing knowledge uh, and the mystery or the revelation of his will. So what we read in verse 8 is that these are the things that God has given us. Verse 17, Paul is praying that these will be true for them, experienced, lived out. He's praying for the very things that God has said he will do. He's not praying, actually, that they would be in a different situation. He's not saying that that they won't be faced with difficulty. Uh, Maybe how to deal with family that don't understand them. Maybe to deal with work colleagues uh, who are saying, actually, you need to do this in a different way that is challenging to you. No, he's not saying, actually, that you'll never have to explain uh, where dinosaurs are in the Bible um, to somebody who really wants to have a go at you. He's never, ever saying that actually uh, people that we love will get it straight away without any issue at all. No, what he's saying is that actually in the midst of difficult decisions, praying that we'd have wisdom and insights, praying that actually when people ask hard questions of us and our faith, that we would indeed have knowledge that when we struggle to explain our faith to those that are close to us or around, that actually God's will will be revealed through them and in them. You see, he's not praying for their situation. He's praying here that God has done things and promised that these are the things that he would give us. And he's praying that according to what God has said, that will be true for them. It's really important, isn't it? That actually he doesn't just pray, oh Lord, take this away from me. He does at times, but he lives with that. But actually saying here, look, God, be with them through these difficulties, through these challenges, through these questions. Grow their faith. Strengthen them. But in a sense, these are the things that uh, he has, uh, in a sense, are what I would call mind things. So he goes on uh, to pray for what God needs to do. And this is what I would call uh, the work of the spirits. And so if you look again at verses 18 to 20, uh, that wonderful word, uh, verse we had that we sung about, having the, hearts of, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened... He's saying, what are the things that I need to pray for people's hearts? Hope, inheritance, and power. They're the things that you'll see in verses 18 to 20. Why does he pray for those things? Well, if you begin to think about the opposites of those, the opposite of hope is dismay and discouragements. Uh, Why do you need to pray for uh, inheritance? Well, actually, the sense in which uh, the opposite of of having everything that's great is actually having nothing, of being uh, worthless, of actually not wanting to keep going because actually there's nothing that's going to make it worthwhile. Or when we think about power, we think uh, that's great, isn't it? But who needs power? Well, it's the weak the failing, those who are insecure. And then you begin to see, don't you then, why these are prayers of the hearts. These are things that the Holy Spirit needs to do. It's not that we need to learn or understand, but actually about the emotions that we feel, what's going on inside us, so that we can better follow him and love one another. 
But note too, again, these aren't uh, ideas that Paul has just plucked out of, uh, of, of his thinking. You can go back and see them in the things that God has lavished upon us. So verse 12 speaks about hope. Verse 11 and verse 14 speaks about inheritance. Uh, verse 13 speaks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit, the one who raised Jesus from the dead. What he's praying here is that, in a sense, that their hearts will be in tune to the reality of who they are. And I, I know I come back to it regularly, 2.6, which I think is at the center of Ephesians, seated with him in the heavenly realms. He's praying now for their hearts, that their hearts would not waver, that their hearts would be strong because of the truth of who they are, the truth of what God has given them. Let me just explore those three things. Hope. Why hope? Uh, he prays for hope because it's so easy, isn't it, to be uh, overwhelmed by our circumstances. Uh, there are times we're just having a, we're having a little uh, laugh in the uh, the vestry earlier this morning um, because actually we're, they were here really early and everything was great and. Uh, Nothing has gone wrong this morning because we've got loads and loads of time. There's almost this look around thinking, <laughs> why is everything so easy this morning? Uh, and of course, when you've got loads and loads of time, nothing goes wrong. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, it was not quite that calm when various things weren't working. There was a Windows update that was trying to go on and all the rest of it. And suddenly, oh my goodness me. And it's really easy, isn't it? I mean, that's just tech team. But actually, so many of us in life have faced moments when we're so easily overwhelmed by what's going on. So easy, isn't it, to be dismayed or discouraged by uh, uh, all that's going on with COVID and our inability to meet, our, our inability to lead the lives that we want to, to see our youngsters uh, struggling with uh, able or not to go to uh, further education, uncertainty about their exams. It's really, really easy to just think, oh, it's too much we're told, aren't we, which is just harrowing, that they have never ever seen uh, more teenagers uh, with mental health issues, more teenagers with self-harming issues than they have at the moment because they're dismayed and discouraged. Paul's prayer it is in a sense that actually if we pray for hope, then what we're saying is we're praying that our eyes will be removed from the situation and all that we see. Like that hymn says, fix your eyes upon Jesus. The idea is, is that we need to change our hearts at what we look at, at what we see, at what is so important. And yes, that is a real hard thing because actually that's a work inside the human heart that's really, really hard. That's why Paul presence or what about uh, praying thinking and praying around inheritance uh, the idea actually that uh, there is something for us that's going to make it all worthwhile he talks elsewhere in in his letters uh, about the crown that the crown that will not perish he talks about actually um, uh, running the race with perseverance to get the prize that it's the end he says, even if the road is long, keep going because it's going to be worth it. I'm sure many of you have been on long journeys for holidays. Can you remember going on holiday? Yeah, uh, many of us have been on long journeys for holidays. Why do we go through those long journeys? Because actually there is something really worthwhile at the end of it that we want, a place where we want to be or things that we want to see. Uh, and uh, that's the idea of an inheritance, isn't it? That's talked about the future glory and the wonder of it is to be seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, to see all the wonder of, of seeing God face to face and knowing that there is no more tears or, 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 or shame or pain or anything. It's great to be in that place. But this is the really good bit. I think it's really good bits. Uh, if you're watching this uh, as a family at home, just turn for a moment and look at the person that's next to you. 
Or, or if you're sitting, um, uh, 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 if you're watching this on your own, just bring to mind somebody that you know really well and love really well uh, from your church family. When Paul talks of inheritance, he is aware that what he's saying is the really good thing that God gives us is the people around us in our church. It's a great idea that throughout the Bible that actually God's inheritance isn't just the great things as to what is to come. It's his people. They are his inheritance. Alison always likes me to quote some Bible verses so she's got something to look up so you can look up Psalm 78 verse 2 uh, if you want to do that. Um, it talks about the, the fact that uh, you know God's people are his inheritance and therefore it's his people that he's lavished with every blessing uh, known in heaven because the future reality is glimpsed now in God's people. So when Paul says pray for the inheritance I think what he's saying is realize that your church is God's gift to you. These people and their gifts uh, and all that they have are my gift to you so that you may know and enjoy all that the blessings of eternity. And therefore the picture in uh, uh, Paul's mind here is, a, is of a church bedecked with jewels, but not sapphires and rubies and emeralds, but a church that has these infinite treasures of love and patience and knowledge and hospitality and kindness. We are rich beyond compare because of the blessings that God has lavished upon us. We are here to love and support and encourage one another. Just how amazing is it to be in a church family? But of course that takes us back, doesn't it, to that very first bit about praying with thankfulness. Because actually if we don't see this in each other, then actually we're going to fall out with each other. We're going to dislike each other and we're going to criticise each other and all the rest of it. And then we'll see nothing of that. It's why Paul will go on and talk about maintaining uh, the, uh, the, the unity in the sp uh, of the spirit in the bond of peace. But inheritance is a heart thing. It's about how we see how we value, how we love each other. And then power. Paul uh, really, really, really labours the importance of the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, just in those few verses where he talks about it, it's not obviously clear in the English, but he uses four different similes in Greek uh, that all mean power that means strength, that mean might, that mean work, that mean authority to rule. All of those he just brings in to that, uh, that phrase about this is the power that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead uh, and has seated him on high and given all authority. Why is this so important? Remember when we first looked at Ephesians, we talked, didn't we, uh, about how that this was a very, very special church, but probably in today's terms, like writing to the church that meets in Iraq. Or uh, if you're praying through um, week by week, um, the persecuted church, you know that this week we're in Libya um, and the church maybe in Libya. I imagine that if you are a Christian in one of those churches, you probably feel fairly weak, uh, fairly insecure, as if uh, everything else that's going on around you is going to crush, uh, might crush the church and make it go on forever. Or maybe for us, that actually, uh, as you look around uh, our, our church family, you wish there were more of this or more of that or more of the other. And all you can see is actually just how much we struggle and how we can't do the things that we want to do. And there are not enough people uh, helping with this or helping with that or serving in other ways. So Paul says, I don't want you to see those things. What I want you to see is what God is doing in your heart and the hearts of your fellow uh, women and men in the church. 
And there are two things. Uh, one is what I would call gospel power. That's Romans 1.8. Uh, uh, the gospel is the power of salvation. It brings us from uh, darkness to light. It, it makes uh, hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. That's the, the wonder of God's grace turning our lives around. And then there is the resurrection power, which uh, you read about in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, that actually just as he has raised Jesus from the dead, so as we pass through the waters of baptism, we're raised from sin and death to new life in Christ. Or you could look at uh, uh, Ephesians 3.20 and uh, the uh, ability, uh, Paul prays again in 3.20, to overcome all that is um, uh, thrown at us and the power of the resurrection in our lives. What Paul is saying is the two most remarkable things in human history, the two most miraculous things, the Lord Jesus being raised from the dead uh, and somebody coming from death to life, um, from sin to faith. These are the power, this is the power that's at work in us. And so what he's saying is, don't give up on yourselves. Uh, and that's really important, isn't it? It's because sometimes it's really hard to love ourselves because we know our struggles, we know our failings, we know how we let the Lord down, we know how we're hesitant to speak, we know how sometimes we just say the wrong things to people that we're trying to share our faith with. It seems to put them off more than anything. And there's times when it's really hard, isn't it, to love ourselves. Because despite the publicity that we might put out there about what, a, what we want people to think we like, we know the truth about ourselves. And so Paul wants us to understand and pray for us to see that power of God at work in our lives. So that we don't love ourselves in a kind of, hey, look at me, I'm cool. But actually, we learn to love because of what we will become. And learn to see that God is making us into wonderful people. But also not giving up on ourselves is about allowing others to love ourselves too. Uh, we had a, a fantastic uh, church warden, uh, Pam. Uh, he was in her 80s when we were in Fontainebleau. Uh, she was on, uh, she was, uh, she lied about her age so that she could be o o on a ship to help with the uh, um, Dunkirk ev evacuations. Uh, she uh, was by that stage um, uh, old enough to be part of uh, crewing some of the, uh, the Navy ships for the, uh, uh, the Normandy landings. Uh, she had gone through a, a life of real hardship. But every week she was there and she was always the one who was first to arrive. She was always cleaning the toilets in the school um, so that everything was great before uh, we arrived and after we'd all gone. Uh, and one Monday Thursday, um, as we did, um, we gathered around and we would just do a service and we'd do some washing of the feet. And I remember it insisting one week, um, one year, that Pam was one of those whose feet were washed. And as I washed her feet, there were tears rolling down her faith, face because actually she was somebody who always gave to others but found it hard to believe that actually, aside from her serving, she had worth. But actually she did. And actually allowing us to love her and care for her became a really, really significant turning point in her life at that point. God's power is at work in us. We need to allow God to be at work. We need to allow God to be at work in others and to love others and to care for others, seeing the good, speaking the good, thinking the good, so that God's power is at work in them. And as we see the goods, we pray for the goods and pray for more of that. Why is this important? I, I'm not gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna finish here, but uh, 
the very last bit talks about actually uh, why this is all important and why we need to pray these things because actually uh, the answer is the fullness of Christ which dwells in the church is God's plan for the world to see and know. So all of this and what we pray for each other and how we pray for each other is vital because it means that actually if we do these things, if we are these people, then actually God is glorified and people will get it because the church living out uh, God's love, living out the power of the Holy Spirit it is God's plan for our worlds. Let's make sure we pray into that and live it out. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the ability to be able to look over uh, Paul's shoulder, see how he prays, uh, and to realize that actually he's praying deep into who they are and how they need to be. Father, thank you too that he does this with love and thankfulness as he sees their potential. He sees all that God is doing. He sees what God will accomplish through them and that cause him great joy and thankfulness. Father, help us to be the same, to pray to the same, to love the same. Help us to bring you glory through that. For your name's sake. Amen.